Well, hello again and thanks once more to each and every one of you for your support of my channel and I hope I still find you all in the very best of health. Now hopefully it won't be too long before we can all once again return to the racetrack and get together once more to race our old classic motorcycles. Although for me personally, this is week 9 of lockdown in Scotland which is showing no signs of a quick return. Now in this next featured video we're going to take a look at four examples of those iconic Japanese yellow racers, so stick around as we check out some excellent RM Suzuki's. Now our first race bike is what I think is a 1978 RM250. Now it may not be entirely accurate on the year but uh, I'm sure it's uh, 1978 or thereabouts. Now I grabbed these few video clips at the Cumberland Grand National in 2018, although I never managed to actually speak or gain any information on the bike from the owner on the day. But it's still a very nice example of a 1970s uh, RM Suzuki, although not fully original with its different rear shocks and exhaust tailpipe but still a lovely little machine nonetheless. Now these 250 Suzuki power plants were uh, very good motors for their time but riders did say that they had a short spread of power with uh, a quick burst from the bottom to mid-range and then not really a lot uh, after. Now reed valve induction of course fed by a 36mm round slide Makuni carburetor. Now these motors also had a new fangled electronic ignition which was uh, quite a new upgrade for its time. Now the front end on these 250s only gave the rider just short of 10 inches of travel which was not great when you consider the equivalent uh, Honda CR250 was serving up about 12 inches of suspension movement. An alloy fuel tank for 1978 of course and uh, 1980 Suzuki would then move to plastic fuel tanks. Of course a very strong and very light alloy swing arm fitted to these uh, 78 250s. Now in 1978 many riders tended to change the tailpipes on these RMs uh, not because they were noisy but because they were actually made of cast iron and uh, quite heavy so riders tended to change them for a lighter alloy replacement and uh, as you can see here this rider has fitted a nice alloy pro carbon racing tailpipe which should go a long way to shedding precious pounds from this little 250. But for a 250 motocrosser these RMs were not particularly light bikes and I think they actually clocked in at about 230 pounds which was a bit on the heavy side considering uh, this was still an air-cooled two-stroke 250. But these were still very quick little uh, racers for their time with decent front suspension and of course that perky uh, reed valve motor. Only riders did complain at the time that the original factory fitted rear shocks were not good which tended to let the rear of the bike jump around on anything but a flat, smooth racetrack. But this is still a nice example of a 1978 RM250. Okay, next up it's the turn of Mike van der Meer's 1977 370 Suzuki. Now again, this is not a fully original machine from that year, but uh, still a nice looking bike. And this is Mike's uh, backup machine to his 250 Michael that he normally uh, races. Again, this particular model had uh, very good suspension, uh, sharp handling and a decent two-stroke motor. And when the rider was in the mood and had the bike set up just right, these uh, were bikes that could still be first across the finish line. 
Now this particular bike was actually scheduled to be ridden by American rider John de Lagnus at the big Drumlandrig Castle event in Scotland in 2020. Although, as with everything else in this current climate, that was another event that was cancelled because of the dreaded COVID-19. But they say that these 370 reed valve motors were near as damn carbon copies of Roger de Coster's RN370 works bike and uh, with a 5-speed gearbox and uh, a new steel frame it was still a decent little package. Now these motors once again were fitted with Suzuki's PEI or uh, Pointless Electronic Ignition to give it its uh, full title. OK, these were not the best motocrossers from 1977, although some might say that the Yamaha and even the Michael were better bikes, but these 370s were quite easy to ride and very competitive in their day. OK, moving on, our next featured bike is Paul Burney's 1980 RM125. Now yet again it's another nice uh, looking machine, uh, not 100% of course from 1980 due to its different rear shocks and a possible change of expansion chamber which looks like it's been made by Malcolm Smith products but uh, nevertheless a very nice little Suzuki. Now these 1980 bikes were of course the last of the air-cooled Suzuki two-strokers as uh, just a year later Suzuki would then launch their brand new RM125 which was their first ever liquid cooled motocrosser. Now Paul the bike's owner told me on the day I took these uh, clips that this was his very first time out on a motocrosser in 25 years and he was looking forward to being back on the track racing once again. Although Paul's return to the track was uh, very brief and short-lived as the little Suzuki 125 motor seized up on him on the very first lap of practice. So hopefully Paul's now got the motor sorted and it won't be too long, hopefully not another 25 years before we see him back on the racetrack once again. But when they're working fine, these are buzzy little motors, although you have to dance around on the gearbox and keep the revs high to keep uh, that engine in its sweet spot. Now, a nice pair of Olin shocks on Paul's bike, which are of course better quality than the factory originals, and they will certainly improve the handling on the rear of this uh, pocket rocket. But despite its engine problems on its inaugural racing uh, debut, it's still a lovely machine and when everything's working right and the bike suspension and motor settings are spot on, these can be very competitive bikes if the tracks are tight and twisty. OK, our final Suzuki machine in this short uh, video clip is Brian Hamilton's 1983 RM500. Now these 83 RM500s were Suzuki's answer for a bike to compete in the big open class formula which was all the rage in motocross in the early 1980s. Now every bike manufacturer had their own interpretation of an open class racer at the time and this was Suzuki's pitch with that uh, stonking 500 two stroke engine and their very unique full floater rear suspension. Now this 500cc engine was actually the older RM465 motor which was bored out to make it a fully blown 500. Now the cylinder head was also redesigned for this 1983 model and surprisingly the engine only had a 4 speed gearbox. More than likely because it now had a bigger motor and Suzuki's thinking was that uh, if you had more power then you would need less gears. And also riders say that uh, the carburation was a problem when these bikes left the factory and it was difficult to tune the flat slided 38mm Makuni carb. Plus the carbs on these bikes had no idle circuit so you had to be on your toes 
into the slow turns. Now one of the other items criticised on these bikes back in the day was the marshmallow type front forks which riders complained was just far too soft for an open class motocross bike. Although mind you the rear end of the big 500 was a very different story and Suzuki's full floater dual linkage uh, suspension system was one of the best rear ends on an open class bike of its day. Now the single rear monoshock unit was mounted on a linkage at both the top and the bottom which as the description suggests allows the shock to then float independently at each end. Now these two alloy support struts were part of that very successful full floater suspension assembly. Now an alloy box section rear swing arm of course which combined with the rest of the 500's full floater rear end was just a sign of things to come on motocross machines in the future and variations on Suzuki's systems would be copied on other manufacturers race bikes. But despite the big Suzuki's little niggles this was still a very fast and reliable open class racer. Now it wasn't as quick as its equivalent Honda CR or KX Kawasaki but it was lightweight and it could turn on a dime and of course it had one of the best rear suspension systems on the market. So there you have it, I hope you've enjoyed uh, taking a look at a few of these Suzuki examples in this very short video and uh, don't forget if you like what you see then remember to subscribe to my channel to view more of these old vintage crossers right here on Classic Dirt Bike TV. This video was brought to you in association with World Sport, the world's number one supplier for all your off-road and leisure sportswear. Just visit their online website for more information.